Welcome to the Business of Story podcast, where the world's best storytellers from business, Hollywood, and beyond teach you how to use stories to communicate and connect with your customers. The Business of Story is sponsored by ACT, the best-selling customer management software for small business, Oracle Marketing Cloud, enabling businesses to target, engage, convert, analyze, and use marketing technology to deliver a better customer experience. Sixter, helping clients maximize the impact of every single email sent. And by Zigna Labs, the real-time cross-media story tracking platform. Here's your host, Park Howell from Park & Co. And today's special Business of Story guest. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Business of Story. I'm Park Howell, and it's just great having you here with me again today. Whether you're listening to me on your laptop, or you've got your earbuds in, or you're mowing the lawn, or you're walking the dog, or you're flying somewhere. Anyway, thank you so much for um, sharing some of your time with us here at Business of Story, where I've had really for the past year the absolute honor of reaching out and finding some amazing, amazing story artists around the world. And in fact, I will say, I don't know if I've done as much reaching out as the universe has been delivering them to me, because the one thing I have found about doing this podcast, it has completely opened up my world to really terrific professionals and story people, story artists, you know, around the galaxy, if you will. And today's no different. You know, today we have a really funny, young, professional writer, communicator, storyteller out of Los Angeles. Her name is Jenny Barris. Jenny actually comes from the Midwest, has those wonderful Midwest uh, sentimentalities of, of hard work and honesty, integrity. You just find it with the folks out there. There's so much fun, family-oriented. She also has some really humorous stories about being raised Jehovah's Witness and how she had to go out and ring the doorbell and see about converting you know, folks over to her religion. And I asked her, it sounded like she got converted more often to theirs than they did to hers because the great thing about Jenny is she absolutely cares more about you and me and her clients and the people that she helps in their lives than she does about herself. You'll see that. It rings through and true in this interview today. It's so refreshing. She's so funny and what a bright, bright, talented mind. Great to have her here. Um, before we jump into that, though, I want to also express thanks to all of you from around the world that I've had a chance to work with and who have gone to iTunes and said something about the show. The wonderful thing, of course, about having a podcast is you literally get to connect with people in all reaches of the world. I mean, I am now working or have been working with people from New Jersey to Quebec to California, all across North America. Helped a young lady yesterday in Oxford, England, uh, help her get her story straight as a solopreneur. Just got back from London and Liverpool where we did some amazing, had just a blast with some uh, business of storytelling workshops with my good friend Brian Adams who has a terrific agency out there called PH Creative. Also then jumped up into the Netherlands. We did a master class in a, a suburb of Amsterdam called Harlemier and uh, worked with some of the politicians out there and businesses as they are growing out the Silicon Valley of sustainability in this really fun, interesting little town called Harlemier. Actually, it's really quite a large town, but they're doing some really cool things with it. But that's the impact I've been able to have when I have truly followed this passion of trying to understand how story works in our lives and how we can make it work for us. Understanding the stories that we tell ourselves are the most potent stories at all, of all. So we want to make sure we, we tell ourselves good stories. And then we want to live into those stories. And again, our, our guest today, she exemplifies that. Jenny is just amazing at what she's done with her life in a very short amount of time and the, and the fun she's having helping people uh, in the creative freelance world as writers make their way, find their voice, find their story, make their way. So before we get into that, I want to share a couple of the thoughts that came in on iTunes over the past week. It's great. I just so much fun seeing the impact this is having or the impact story that people are already using story in their lives are having out there. So this came in from Stan Dubin or Dubin, D-U-B-I-N. And he says, 
I've always felt the best way to describe what we do or what our business does is to tell a really good story. A true story, of course, but something far different from the corporate speak we see and hear so often. When I'm wearing the sales hat in my business, the most compelling part of a sale is when I tell a story or two to the prospect. They just seem far more attentive when I'm telling them a story about the service than they are about the service itself. I'm glad I bumped into Business of Story podcast. It has helped me expand my business storytelling skills. And I love that that Stan says expand because he's already using it. He's appreciating the potency of it. And the thing I'm sure I hope you're finding, Stan, that I found too, is when you approach a project um, or your life as an author might a story, it's just so much more fun and different and interesting. And especially if we can get out of that um, that basal thinking of features and benefits, advertising and marketing and communication that we that besets us, in, especially when we're working with the B2B world or the professional services world. And peel back the onion, find the heart within that organization and service offering, and then tell really fun, interesting stories around it. It is amazing how you can nudge the world literally in any direction you choose. So thank you, Stan, for sending that in. Um, Right before that, Michael Ray, dad, D-A-D, maybe he is a dad, gave me three great, no, four great words here. Thanks. Keep it up. I love that. Thank you so much, Michael, for taking the time to pop in. And one more. How about Rising Master says, a lot of great information about storytelling. It is hard to pick one episode. They're all great. So actually, he said good. Uh, So thank you, Rising Master. I appreciate that. And if you've been listening to the show or this is your first show and it touches your heart, it, it helps reignite that innate storyteller with you, then let the world know about your story. Please go on to iTunes and give us a rating or shoot me a note. My email is park at businessofstory.com, and I would love to hear how this is working for you or if I can answer any questions in the meantime. And, of course, you can go to businessofstory.com. We have a ton of different uh, tools that you can use to download. We have this all-new and an improved DIY workbook to help you get your brand story straight. It's a guide to help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. It's all interactive now. You can write right within the book in a PDF form, all kinds of new resources in there. So you can get that at businessofstory.com as well. And I'm here to serve you and honor your story and the journey you're on. So just let me know how I can help. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to an amazing young professional, a lady that I know can help because I learned so much from this interview and I had so much fun. I don't know if I've laughed harder in an interview. You're going to love her. Here is Jenny Barris. Jenny, welcome to Business of Story. Hi, Park. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great. And you got to tell us where you are exactly because you have a unique ambiance to your voice. (laughs) Well, I live in Los Angeles, California, but I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, and I did a little pit stop in Sarasota, Florida between Ohio and LA. And you're literally sitting among boxes in your (laughs) new home. Is that, is that, is that what's going on? I can just picture it. I am. I'm I'm sitting on a bistro table in an empty dining room with tons of boxes behind me, but a really nice chair that I set up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what are you? Are you in the middle of a move or what's happening there? I just moved a few weeks ago, so I'm a, I will probably be in the middle of this m- this portion of the move for the next six months. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, you're ambitious. It could be the next six years if it were me anyway. Never That's quite true. get unpacked. <laughs> no, I know it's true. I probably, I probably will be still pulling, you know, t-shirts out of boxes a couple years from now. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jenny, it's so great to have you here. Our mutual virtual friend, John Lim, uh, recommended you for the show. He's got a pretty amazing podcast on people that are really making a difference in the world out there. And you and I had a chance to chat a while ago, and I was just really amazed at your story. Would you mind give us, giving us the backstory of where did you come from, where are you now, and where are you going? Sure. Okay. So I have always been a writer and a storyteller for as long as I can imagine. And when I was in my early, you know, my late teens, my early twenties, I really thought that I was going to find wealth by dropping out of college, waitressing and writing a play that would be a smash hit on Broadway. (laughs) Um, 
I, I, as you can imagine, Tony Robbins, Warren Buffett, they're not going to be telling you that that's the recipe towards, you know, wealth <laughs> or anything as I quickly, <laughs> as I quickly discovered. And so I started to realize that the power, the, the ability that I had to tell a story had to be valuable, right? It had to be worth something to somebody. And I didn't have to suffer slinging eggs and bacon you know, until that play hit Broadway or I sold a screenplay. And so that's when I started to figure out, hey, you know, I can take a risk. I can take, I was literally down to my last 75 bucks in my pocket. And I thought, you know, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know who's going to buy words, but I know that people do. I do know that people buy into story. Um, and so I started to discover the copywriting field as a way to really, it just started as a way to supplement, um, you know, or support my creative ventures. And it ended up turning into a, a full blown, <laughs> a full blown business that I've run for the last 10 years. Well, Jenny, were you always a storyteller? I mean, just as a kid growing up, did you always have that ability to tell stories? Always and wild stories. I went to my when I went to my high school grad uh, reunion a couple years ago. There's people who still uh, who still didn't talk to me because of some of the wild stories I told, and they thought I was a complete weirdo then. And they, okay, tell us a story. Tell us a wild story. Give us an example. Oh my God. Okay, this is really embarrassing, but I have a feeling this is kind of like a no judgment space. So absolutely. All right. Awesome. Well, here we go. So I had a really tough time in middle school and my way of connecting with people was through story, except I didn't realize, you know, when you're a kid, you don't realize that your stories have to be true and they have to make sense. And people are going to think you're completely nuts if they, if they're, you know, off the beaten path a little bit, especially with kids at that age, they're trying so hard to, you know, fit in and play kickball together and do all kinds of things. And I was always the outcast because I was always telling wild stories. Elementary school, I used to tell, I used to sit in the middle of the blacktop and I would tell people I was in the middle of a witch's pond and there were witches all around us and magical spells. And, you know, I probably could have given JK Rowling a run for her money if I knew that that was a, you know, wizards and witches, you know, had a, had some, selling power, but people just avoided me. They just thought, oh, there's that weirdo girl in the middle of the blacktop thinking it's a witch's pond. So I thought my story wasn't big enough. So I graduated to middle school and I was having trouble fitting in. And I sat in the classroom and people said, what are some really funny stories that you've told, you know, that have happened to your family? And realistically, I could have actually chosen a number of really wild, funny stories that were true, but true wasn't good enough for me. So I told my, this is so embarrassing. (laughs) (laughs) I told my fifth grade class that my mom was busy make, because my mom used to make these fancy drapes and that she was making fancy drapes and that she accidentally glued my little brother to the drapes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that I walked in and saw my brother swinging from the drapes as she was opening and closing them. Um, the class was, they laughed, but I didn't realize they weren't laughing at the story. They were laughing at me. And two days later, my parents got called in for a parent-teacher conference about my about my stories. My And my teacher was kind of mean about it. She's like, she loves to tell these you know, lies to the class. And my mom's like, she's a writer. She's a storyteller. She likes to tell stories. It's not, you know, she's not maliciously, you know, feeding your class Mm -hmm. garbage. So my parents went to bat for me on that, um, but it was really mortifying. And so the, the kids, some of the kids who didn't like me from that story were still nasty to me, <laughs> you know. Well, Jenny, years, you're the embodiment later. of what we talk about in our story workshops is that when I ask people if they're storytellers, maybe 10% of the room will go up, and I will say that you were at the tops of your games in kindergarten, and you're a good example of this. You were at the top <laughs> of your game, and then what happens? You get this educational system that beats you down, calls the parents in, says, you know, she's a big-time storyteller. That's not good. We need to close that down. And that's, that's just sad, you know? I I think I've always say the greatest stories are inspired by actual events, whether they happened or not. Um, <laughs> I was the same kind of guy growing up. And luckily, between you and I, you know, that inner storyteller didn't get dampened. So, um, you know, it, it sounds like, though, you didn't let that stop you. You didn't let that one teacher beat down stop you that you kept going with your storytelling. I, I really did. I don't think I don't think that I I mean, I cared. I really wanted people to like me as every fifth grader does. But at the same time, I, I don't think I knew how to turn it off. And my family, 
my family is really interesting. They, they really march to their own beat. They really value people who have their own agenda. Um, they're kind of, they're kind of Adam's family like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now this is the, coming from the same lady that told her that her mother glued your your brother to the curtain. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So maybe you can see the correlation. So yeah, they really encouraged yeah. me to just, you know, as long as I was respectful to people and as long as I was a, you know, had had good manners and was a good kid and didn't act out, they really encouraged me to, you know, march to my own march to my own beat. They really. They really weren't impressed by social norms. There were very few things that you could do to impress my parents. And usually things that impressed my parents were really weird. Um, and so that really allowed me to grow up in an environment where I was free to have that kind of creative play and nothing was crazy. I told, you know, I used to go in my backyard and tell my mom I was, you know, digging around for Civil War artifacts. And she was like, go for it. Never know. <laughs> <laughs> and where did you grow up? I grew up in a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. In Cleveland, okay. And what did your folks do, your dad do for a living? My dad was, um, he started off in aerospace and he ended up being a plant manager for a steel company. Mm -hmm. And my mom was mostly a stay-at-home mom, but she had a background in cosmetology, in real estate, and she also worked as a teacher's assistant at a middle school for a little bit. So an eclectic parental unit that uh, sounds like they really, as you said, embrace the unknown. Didn't like the norm, just go out and do your thing. So you decided you wanted to make money with your writing. How old were you when you had that $75 left and you figured you had to go do something? And then what did you do? So I was, you know, I had tried for a little bit. So I was in my early 20s and I decided that... (laughs) <laughs> I decided that I was just sick of waiting tables and I decided that I didn't want to, um, you know, you have this dream, especially, you know, I'm in, in Los Angeles and I see it all the time. You have all of these writers and you have, it affects the actors as well. They put so much of their life in the present on hold because they're waiting for someone to approve of the story they're selling or approve of the story that they're telling. And it's really upsetting. And I found myself in that in that um, hamster wheel, and I wanted to get off it as soon as possible. So I started to just poke around and see who, you know, what kind of words were selling. The script wasn't selling, but somebody had to be buying words. <laughs> so I started just to look online, and, and I found my, actually for, found my first client on Craigslist at four in the morning, which is probably warning signs all over that. <laughs> and what kind of <laughs> client was it? Um, I, it was a it was a client who was doing a few things. He was working on short films, so he needed help with his short film. But he also needed help with the marketing copy on the website to promote his short film. And we got to talking. Um, we really ended up we ended up driving, and he gave me the he gave me my first gave me my first gig. And you had done some screenwriting prior to this, had you not? I started off with playwriting, yes. And then when I moved to Los Angeles, I started working more with screenwriting and um, and television writing. And did you have success with that? So I did option. So I had um, success with the, with the plays, believe it or not. The plays I've been produced up and down the East Coast, which is really exciting. I've won a few awards. I've earned all of $82. <laughs> <laughs> Off of my artist. plays. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then in LA, I moved here because I had actually optioned a script with my writing partner at the time. It was an action adventure script. Um, I'm a comedy writer, so that was a comedy story all in itself. You know, it's nothing like walking into the room with, a, with the, the line that says, and he shed one single tear and have everybody look at you and say, that's terrible. Nobody <laughs> sheds one single tear because I'm, <laughs> you know, so, but I, but I thought, you know, you're the one that asked the comedy writer to come on board. So I optioned that, um, that script and we worked on that for a couple of years and it went to Warner brothers and then nothing happened. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like most, like most scripts that are done. And, um, then I started learning about television writing because, so much of what I love about theater and writing plays, I found the parallel in, in, co- in television comedies. And so I started to back away from features a little bit and really sink my teeth into learning how to write a TV pilot. Um, and for the record, writing a television pilot is the hardest writing I've ever done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, you, you pitch a script and someone says, great, so what do you see for the next 
133 episodes. <laughs> yeah. And so, you go, uh, let me get back uh-huh. to you. Exactly, exactly. So that's, that's where my creative, um, my creative work is right now, so, um, is with the television writing. But you are also working with writers and I guess communication professionals in general, if, if I'm correct on that, and helping them understand what their story is and how to be better at telling it and I guess telling stories on behalf of their clients. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So I realized that this accidental success that I had with my copywriting business was really because I'm incapable of being stuffy and I'm incapable of being that white collared, stiff professional that doesn't share anything about myself. And usually, you know, people kind of back away from wanting to share things. Um, but before, before there were a lot of blogs and a lot of, you know, marketing professionals talking about the importance of story, I was jumping right in with these clients and saying, you know, this is telling them that I was a struggling playwright, telling them that, you know, um, what I felt like I really could offer. I really understood that there was value to storytelling. And so I shared a lot about myself with my clients. I mean, I didn't beat them overhead with, you know, sob stories, but I shared a lot of funny details, funny, relatable details with prospects that I was interested in um, working with. And I noticed that I would write to somebody and they would say, you know, we posted, you know, we posted an opportunity. We got 500 people who replied. Um, you don't have any experience in this area, but your enthusiasm, your passion, your storytelling, it really intrigues us and we're going to give you a shot. So when I started thinking about the background of where I came from and looking at these super talented writers, these super talented communication professionals that were having trouble being seen, that were having trouble, um, you know, getting their story out there. I realized that I really could help them by kind of taking the choke collar off of their story, letting them share letting them share more of who they were, their funny stories, their family stories. How did they, you know, what were their funny, funny failures? I do like to make things comedic when possible. Um, Mm -hmm. And I realized that this started my clients who maybe were just starting in the field or maybe they had tried for a year or two on their working on their freelance business when they started to relax and they started to treat humanize the whole process and just connect and tell stories, their business completely changed. I mean, we're talking, we're we're talking increasing revenue by 50%, 60% sometimes, um, launching a successful freelance business in 11 months, um, where you were working, you know, at Starbucks and now you're running a show, your own show and you're contracting out other professionals. So it's been really exciting to see how the power of story drives that connection and just brings that, that human aspect to, to marketing and, and makes you stand out online. Now, Jenny, you were never trained as a a marketing creative writer or a content marketing writer, correct? Correct. I have ballet training. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So is that a benefit? For me, you know, I'm very – I understand that everybody has a different path. And, I'm, you know, for example, like if you are passionate about – you know, I always say – I don't necessarily think college is necessary, but if you're going to cut me open or represent me in court, please have that piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely think it was a benefit. I was able to, I didn't have a whole lot of people in my head telling me how to tell my story. Now, I also naturally went with what I, normally the things we naturally gravitate to are the things that we happen to be good at. So I had a baseline of talent there that I just got to play with and exploit a little bit, sometimes take it too far, sometimes, you know, maybe not, not say it enough. But I feel like because I got to experiment with this, without teachers in my ear, without training, um, just kind of on my own, my own path, I do think it made me a better storyteller. Um, I have taken television. I do want to say I have taken television classes and screenwriting classes and things like that because the structure of those things are just a different animal than telling your own story. But as far as the storytelling in my, in my business with my copywriting, my marketing and coaching, I've never had any training. 
Yeah, and and I ask that question, and it's certainly a loaded question because I think it does help. I mean, I've been at this line of work a long time, and I know I sometimes fall into those same old traps, and I have to get out and become that intentional storyteller again. And I think that happens to a lot of us in the communications world, especially in the business-to-business or professional services firms, where you can get trapped, just like that teacher of yours that Jenny's telling stories, that's bad, stop her, Uh, (laughs) have clients say, my age agencies trying to tell stories, that's bad, stop them. Um, you hear that time and time again. So you coming out into this world, you know, as a storyteller, but not as a marketer, probably is a really like perfect timing for you and your clients for that matter. Thank you. I, I think so. I've seen, I've seen how it works and I've been, it's just been really, sometimes I feel like it's, it just was this wonderful stroke of luck, but at the, at the same time, I feel like everybody, regardless of what business you're in, could really let go of a little bit of the emotional constipation, laugh a little bit, relax a little bit, and tell the stories that we feel have shaped us and find a way to work that into into your material. In fact, one of the trends um, online that I really like, this is something that I've seen a few coaches and consultants do that I think is a great move, is a lot of people are starting to take what they would put in their about section, and they're not having an official about section, and they're putting that story right on the homepage. You know, Mm -hmm. instead of saying what I do, they're saying, here's who I am. They're leading off with a story that, you know, brought them to where they are today. And I really, really love that idea of of not making the about section, you know, the last thing on the upper right hand corner, but right smack in the middle when somebody lands on the homepage. So that's like a, that's a trend in, in storytelling for marketers that I love right now. Mm -hmm. Well, Jenny, you went from your own successful business that uh, you grew pretty quickly into now helping others do the same thing. Can you tell us a little bit about that growth and what do you think some of the secrets were that you discovered in that process? Sure. Um, The growth, it was funny because the first year, like any business, the first year I did not know. I mean, I really didn't know what I was doing. And by the second year, I started to get a, a hang of you know, what people were looking for, what was, you know, what is good copy? You know, what, what do you bring to the table? Why do people need to, to have good copy? Um, what is the value behind it? I started to really have an understanding of that. But I would say that my, the reason it was able to grow so quickly is because I never connect with somebody. And, and, and to this day, I never reach out to somebody or respond to an email or respond to anything and think this is my next client. That is never, that doesn't even cross my mind. What I'm looking to do is to, to connect and see if we, if we can connect. Can I help you? Can I provide you with some sort of value? And is there, and I love, I, I love conversation. I love talking with people. And every time I had an opportunity to share about my services, I was more interested in learning about, in learning about theirs. I actually, this is, I've, I've didn't even think about sharing this, but so I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness, and I hated knocking on doors, hated it with a giant passion. So I would go up to people's doors, and I would pretend like I was ringing the bell, but I wasn't actually ringing the bell. And I'd write it down that they weren't home. And so eventually people started to catch on, and they would ask me to, you know, you have to ring the bell, you have to talk to people, here's, here's, what, you're, you know, here's what you have prepared to say. And so I would get up there, and I would find that I would – go and I would, I would have the pamphlet and the Bible and everything. And I would go to talk about what I was there to talk about. And someone would say, no, I have my own religion. And they would tell me about something I didn't know about. So someone would say, no, I'm, you know, I'm Hindu or no, I'm Buddhist or no, I'm Catholic or no, I'm Jewish. And I would be so excited about what they did. And I would spend 25 minutes standing at the door, you know, I mean, I, I've converted nobody, if you, if you can imagine. And how many times were you converted? You could come home and say, hey, Mom, Dad, I'm Catholic, all of a sudden. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Ah. But I was amazed. You know, tell me more about Catholicism. Tell me more about Judaism. You know, I want to go to a bar mitzvah. It was, and so eventually they just stopped having me knock on doors because it was... <laughs> you were trouble for the cause. You weren't helping at all. I was trouble for the cause. But whatever that is, yeah. Whatever that is, is what I use to build my business. That's curiosity. And I guess really connecting with people. So they did a favor. They did you a favor in pushing you out in that uncomfortable zone of going and <laughs> ringing on doorbells to talking to strangers. But it sounds like your natural curiosity about those folks took over, which really feeds the storyteller inside you, in, inside of all of us, I suppose. 
Absolutely. It's, I don't know if you've read um, Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic. Uh, uh, no, book. I haven't. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing for anybody who loves storytelling, whether you're doing it for your business or you're doing it on the creative side or you're doing both. Big Magic is a must read because she talks about exactly what you're saying, that you must follow that curiosity. And as long as you follow the curiosity, you're going to end up with a story that you love. You're going to end up with something that drives you and that ultimately serves other people. Absolutely. Well, Jenny, let's take a break for our sponsors so that we can share their great stories. For without them, it'd be difficult to bring business of story to the world. And when we come back, maybe you can give our listeners a few more tips on um, what we can all do to help continue to expand our business and you know grow as storytellers and therefore help the profession of storytelling and businesses grow. So let's cover that right after these messages. Hey, if you like what you're hearing here on Business of Story, then you are going to love Definitive, the email from Convince and Convert that many marketers say is the most useful resource around. Each day, the team at Convince and Convert picks a topic and sends you the three best resources ever created about that topic. It's topical, it's timely, it's useful. So go to definitivedigest.com and subscribe for free right now. Hey, I've got a question for you. What's the best call-to-action button color on your website? Yeah, you probably didn't see that one coming, did you? Well, what's the best shape and sizes of your CTA buttons? And what copy gets more clicks? You know, these questions have interrupted my sleep patterns for weeks now until I downloaded a helpful new email marketing guide from Emma called Why We Click, The Psychology Behind a Great Call-to-Action. You'll learn how applying just a little bit of brain science can transform your CTA buttons into small but mighty conversion powerhouses. It covers the button color, copy, and placement that helps skyrocket click rates. Check it out at myemma.com forward slash click. You know, Emma helps marketers everywhere send smart, stylish email newsletters, promotions, and automated campaigns, and to help us all rest a little easier knowing our email marketing is doing its job. So check out their new publication at myemma.com forward slash click. All right, welcome back to Business of the Story and our guest today, Jenny Barris. Jenny, uh, just great having you here. It's so much fun uh, hearing your backstory, and now that you're in... Um, LA, you are uh, doing great things with your own company in writing. Um, but tell us a little bit about your coaching side and how you coach others to do the same thing or experience the same sort of exciting growth that you've had. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm so excited. First of all, I am so excited we're having this conversation. Is there are very few things that I'm as passionate about as as storytelling, and so this is just really an honor. Um, but as far as my own clients. I feel that what I do with them is I help them, I help them loosen up first. I, I realize there's so much anxiety about what people think they should do. Um, but when I started my business, I heard nothing back. And in the beginning, I would send out a hundred emails. I'd hear nothing back. And I took a look at them and I realized that the reason was because I was trying to mimic something that I felt pressured, something that I wasn't and something that I felt pressured into being, you know, I didn't graduate college. I didn't have any professional background. And so I wanted to make my, my emails overcompensate for that. I wanted them to say, you know, have that dear sir, dear, dear madam sound, you know, and I realized that nobody reads that. And especially when you're writing or you're writing, you're in communication, that first email, whether it's a cold email or it's a warm email or you're interacting on social media, that is your first sample. People are never going to hire a copywriter or a content strategist or a marketer if that email bores them to tears. And so I realized this is my first writing sample. I'm telling people that I'm you know, that I'm witty and I'm fun and I'm smart and I can get people's attention. And this email is better than taking a Lunesta. This email is putting everybody to sleep. So what I do with my clients is I, I shake them out of that state of anxiety at first. And so much of the anxiety comes from the fact where they want a business, but they have no idea where to start. And I always tell them, I have the action steps. I can tell you exactly what to do. I can give you a daily schedule of how to get clients, you know, how to build the business, how to get your business up to six figures. But what I can't 
I can't do any of this. This does not work if, A, you're not willing to shake off the anxiety, and, B, you're not willing to, what I call, is talk your business into existence. And that is so related to telling about your personal story because nobody wants to hear about the business. They want to hear about you with a little tag at the end on how about what you do. And so I always work with my clients on, you know, what's the most embarrassing thing that's happened to you? Like, what makes you relatable human being? I don't care about where you graduated from. I don't care that you have six years of experience. I don't care, and neither do they. How do you relate? What is the commonality? And that's what I help clients break through. And then when I give them the action steps, it just goes so much faster and so much better because they just don't take it that they don't take it as seriously and they are willing to loosen up and have fun with it. And with that comes the relatable stories. Isn't that interesting that we default to status quo, just as you did? Mm -hmm. You came out and you, it sounded like, looked around and said, well, this is the way people do these emails. I guess I better do them the same way. And you did them, got absolutely zero response, and then go, wait a minute, maybe I need to do it Jenny's way. (laughs) You know, I mean, seriously. Yeah. what happened? I thought, you know, well, you know, what are you going to do? Here I, here I am. This is what I offer. And, um, you know, when I was 17, I accidentally backed over my na- next door neighbor and Ooh. that's a, <laughs> yeah. In it a ended, car a bi- or a, a bicycle? In a car. He Gosh. was 84 years old at the time. He lived, he was fine. And it was this, this experience where I was playing my music too loud. I had just gotten my license. My parents had given me they're old. It was an old Lexus, and it was navy blue with purple tint and gold rims. It was beautiful. Yeah, it was just beautiful. It was just beautiful. And I was bumping Jay Z or something, and I just felt this horrible thump. And I turned around, didn't see anything. Then I felt this scraping. My dad came running out. It was this. It was this whole thing, and it ended up. Be, it ended up turning. He was okay, and it turned out to be a story that was that was funny, that was kind of relatable, that was sort of, you know, if you could, if you can live through running somebody over, (laughs) you know, there's, there's some merit to you there. And so believe it or not, but that's a story that I told in a business sense, a lot of times when I was first introducing myself to clients, when I was first, you know, getting to know people and I'm not shy too. Like when I ask for that first phone call or I'm sending that first email, I ask about the person. And that's something that I recommend. You can, you can launch straight into your pitch, right? You can say, this is what I offer your business. This is the value I bring to the table. This is what I've noticed we can work on. And they're going to send that straight to spam because you're just talking about, they're probably, honestly, they're probably on Facebook at the time you sent that email, not as concerned about those issues at the moment as you are. But what they are concerned about is how they relate to their business, how they relate to their issues, how that business affects them. And so I like to get to know somebody first. I always like to try to interact on social media first. I, but before, I always like to try to just send an email to get to know somebody before I launch straight into the, um, you know, open up my trench coat and there's a, there's a stack of copywriting services. So I highly recommend that you go for the person before you go for the business. And you have that line I love, talk your business into existence. How do you support <laughs> that? What do you mean by that? Okay, so this idea I got from Truman Capote. <laughs> ah, so Truman a Capote, the yeah, and you don't get better than Truman Capote. But I heard a long time ago that Truman Capote, when he was moved to New York, um, he with his mother, you know, he had some great essays and stories that he wrote in school, but he didn't have anything professional, and he was really good at just talking to people and mingling. And, and, you know, he was obviously, he always had the, the cigarette and the martini. That's how, that's how we remember him. But even as a younger, young, like a younger man, he would go to these fancy cocktail parties and he would just talk. He would tell dazzling stories. He would talk about, you know, with confidence that he was a good writer. Um, he would just talk about what he what he thought he was or what he, what he knew he was going to be was okay for him to talk about in the moment because he was so confident that he was going to get there. And eventually, um, he happened to run into the editor-in-chief of The New Yorker at one of these parties. And remember, he didn't have much anything else but a bunch of school stories that he wrote. And the editor of The New Yorker was so impressed with him 
that they gave him his first job at the New Yorker, and that's where he stayed for years and years and years. Um, and he didn't have he didn't have much to show um, for anything when he started going to these parties. And so I heard that story, and I was like, "Oh, that's awesome! I don't really have much to show for anything either." <laughs> <laughs> So there has to be something here. And so everywhere I went, I would talk about my business, how much I loved it and all my clients. And I loved the way, you know, I had one client. I loved the way the word clients rolled off my tongue. And I would talk about this client and that client. I would just have a ball. And, you know, one of my best clients I got when I was three bourbons in wearing sparkle tights at a Christmas party, because you have to talk about it like it's you're already the business owner, right? It doesn't matter if you don't have the income coming in. It doesn't matter if the clients are in are coming in yet. What matters is that you understand that you absolutely do own a business and the outer influences don't matter. And once you can really step into that place of, I'm not starting a business. I'm not trying to start a business. I'm not almost starting a business. I have a business. And when you step into that place and you let yourself play with that idea, you end up talking about it in a way that is just so magnetic and in a way that other people want to play and participate in that you end up attracting so many clients in the, in the most unusual, in the most unusual spots. That's just fabulous. I, I love that idea of, of creating that clearing in your life and then developing that story and making it a bold story. I know you talk about that, too, that quite often we shy away from our stories and we don't make them bold enough, uh, whether, or not, you know, whether or not we don't believe in them or we don't think others will believe in them. But uh, talk a little bit about how does one get over that sensitivity of not thinking in that bold story and living into that bold story mindset? I think with anything, I think you bring up a really good point because I think so many of us do shy away from it. Um, but I think that it's practice, like anything. I, I think that you have to train your 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 brain is such an interesting is such an interesting um, machine because it's just going to keep telling you whatever it is. You know, beliefs are basically just the the compilation of just thoughts that we've allowed ourselves to think over and over again. And so at first, I think it's something that takes practice and being really mindful. Um, if you're, I tell some of my clients who struggle with talking about their business or talking about what they're doing to write down some of their social engagements they have for the month. You know, just make a list of, oh, I'm going to be at so-and-so's wedding. I'll be at so-and-so's baby shower. And then make a note, write it down that you'll mention your business, that you'll just talk about what you're doing. And this isn't a sales pitch. You're not selling anybody on anything, but you're letting people know what you do. And so when you're first starting, I think it does make a, it does make a big difference to go ahead and look at the different outings that you'll be at or the different opportunities that you'll have to connect with people. And just make a note that that's a goal of yours, that you want to make sure that you bring it up. It gets easier with time because you get excited about it. You know, Jenny, I like that idea that you're talking about feeding your brain evidence that things are going well because we all kind of default to that fearful, scary side. So that's that's really great. You've given us some tips how to do that. Any last tips about how we can really make that a daily behavior activity? Well, you know, I'm definitely on the the camp that writing on the same camp of writing your goals down every day is critical to success because when you write down your goals, especially like for example, my goals and my um my to-do list, they're written together. One's up top, one's on the bottom, so that I can make sure that my goals match my daily tasks. And I think that writing down how you want to feel and how you, and, you know, and, and this evidence that we're talking about that things are going well, that maybe you have a, you know, a new client or maybe you don't have a new client, but you do have a website or maybe, you know, you are starting to talk about your business more. Write down those things. Even if it's just, I'm going to talk my business to, into existence. I will talk to three people today um, and just have conversations about what it is I'm doing. Um, I think that that is one of the most powerful things you can do is have it sitting there on paper right in front of you. Because at the end of the day, having clients, having more business, and I mean the business that's really good, you know, the business that you don't have to work that hard for, the word of mouth business, the referrals, those are relationships and those are are, those are simply the result of a really good conversation. So aim to have better conversations. Aim to have a couple conversations a day. Pencil it in so you don't, you know, so it doesn't, um, so it stays a priority. And I think that 
those tips alone can truly transform your business. Awesome. Jenny, how can people learn more about you and the, the amazing work you're doing? Uh, well, if you want to come play with the storyteller, <laughs> <laughs> you can check out my website. It's jennybarris.com, and there's a couple of ways that we can get in touch. Um, three or four ways. I have a few different things going on as far as a, a monthly radio show where we talk a little bit more about story and a blog and come hang out. I'm sure there's a little something for everyone over there. And that's Jenny Barris, J-E-N-N-Y-B-E-R-E-S.com. Absolutely. Oh, so nice to have you take the time to come and share your stories with us today on Business of Story. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. Absolutely. And thank you all for tuning in to this edition of Business of Story. If you would like to hear some more of our amazing story artists we've had throughout the year, please visit us at businessofstory.com. You will also find storytelling tools there and other techniques in a workbook, a DIY workbook that allows you to really focus and clarify your brand story by taking you through the proven 10-step story cycle process, all based out of Hollywood, on Aristotle's work, uh, inspired by Joseph Campbell. I mean, this is proven stuff. We fine-tuned it down to help you and your business to really make sense of who you are, what you do in this world, and how to craft and tell compelling stories about your business that actually sell. Uh, So thank you again for listening. If you like what you're hearing, please visit us at iTunes. Give us a rating. Share the comments with your friends and families and help us grow this amazing network of story folks, people that really appreciate storytelling and how it can impact our lives. And so we can keep bringing some amazing people back like Jenny. So until next Monday from Business of Story, have a wonderful life. Thanks for tuning in to The Business of Story. Don't forget there are terrific free storytelling resources for you at thebusinessofstory.com, where you'll also find the complete show archive. The Business of Story is sponsored by Oracle Marketing Cloud, Park & Co., Sixter, Zignal Labs, and Act, and is produced by Convince & Convert Media. Find more great shows like The Business of Story at marketingpodcasts.com, the first search engine for marketing podcasts. Podcast Imaging by Audio Bag.